Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to this Resolution Foundation webinar. My name is Torsten Bell. I'm the Chief Executive of the Foundation. Now, um, it's not news that at a Resolution Foundation event we're talking about living standards because that is literally the reason we're a charity. That is what all our projects are on. But what we want to talk about today is the very big picture of living standards, of what happens to household incomes, not just about the level of those incomes, but who gets them. We're going to talk about inequality. Uh, and we want to focus on the big picture of where the country has been over recent decades, the lessons of that history, and what that should mean for us uh, in the decades ahead. That's the, that's the plan, and that's because we're publishing today uh, our annual living standards audit, the 14th one for the Keenies. Anyone that's got the full collection gets a prize, as well as some help, because that's not a good life to be living. The, um, uh, and that's been published today. One of the authors, Adam Caller, who's a principal economist here, is going to take you through the headlines of that report uh, first. Then you're going to hear from Polly Toynbee, who has been telling people to pay attention to what's happening to living standards and inequality before it was fashionable. That means, by the way, in the 2000s, broadly. Uh, it wasn't very fashionable. And then in a change to the advertised schedule, you're also going to hear from Lord... Da it doesn't say Lord here. It's disgraceful. <laughs> Standards, right? Okay. Lord David Willits, who's the president of the Resolution Foundation, who is not Kitty Stewart from the LSE, because she's got COVID, because everybody has got COVID again. Uh, so she couldn't be here. So David has kindly um, stepped in, and he can tell us what the kind of Tory secret plan is to get this living standards problem sorted. Polly's obviously less going to tell us that, uh, but can tell us what the future of social democracy First is. First time I've been on this platform as the Tory, Torsten. Oh, is it? All right. Well, you know, <laughs> you know it's exciting for everyone. Uh, so that's the plan, everybody. Um, the plan for you lot is that you go onto Slido, you put in hashtag living standards, and then you can ask questions, and you're going to vote in two polls about what you care about in life. And they're quite existential, the polls today. OK, that is the plan. Right, Adam, give us the presentation. Thanks, Torsten. So, yeah, today we're going to be taking a, a long-term perspective, um, but it's definitely worth uh, starting by uh, emphasising the, the state that uh, we're in at the moment. Um, with a, a big hit for living standards ongoing. Uh, real wages are falling in the face of very high inflation. Uh, the value of benefits is uh, also falling relative to prices, um, although one-off payments are, are certainly helping. Uh, I think stats last week showed that uh, Real, in, real household incomes fell for the fourth quarter in a row in Q1 of this year, even before the price cap uh, went up again. Uh, and in our previous work, we've shown that uh, it might take until 2026 to get back to where household incomes were in 2019. Um, so that's a bit of context uh, to think about uh, how the UK was positioned uh, going into to this crisis and uh, COVID-19. Um, and what lessons we might need to learn for the future um, to help deliver that, that much needed recovery. Um, so uh, even before COVID-19, um, income growth in the UK was weak. Uh, we look over a 15 year period, so 2004 to 2019, uh, income growth um, was the, uh, the weakest, on, uh, weakest since about the time of the Great Depression, uh, so almost uh, 100 years earlier. Um, but we can also break that down into uh, house households across the income distribution of FED. Um, so in this chart, the, the red line is the experience of, of poorer households. Uh, purple is uh, a higher income households. So you can see, for example, in the 1980s, a big gap opening up between uh, growth rates for poorer households and richer households. Uh, then a period of, of fairly shared growth around the turn of the century. Uh, and after that, uh, a decline to, to almost zero growth for everyone, uh, even before COVID. Um, so obviously a big part of that is the financial crisis and the impact that had on household incomes. Um, that was an international experience, but it's worth saying that uh, the UK's experience of income growth has not been shared across all countries. Um, in terms of household incomes and adjusting for uh, purchasing power in each country. Uh, the UK had the worst decade from, or decade in a bit, from 2007 to 2018 uh, of any European country except for Greece and Cyprus. Uh, as a result, lots of countries have overtaken the UK in typical living standards. So the typical income in Ireland, for example, is now a bit higher than in the UK. Um, 
alongside weak growth, the UK has had persistently high inequality. Um, this recent period has not been like the 1980s where inequality skyrocketed, but nor have, nor have we made any progress in bringing inequality down. Uh, as a result, um, the top 10 most unequal years have all been uh, since the turn of the century. Uh, the UK is also unequal uh, by international standards. Uh, this Gini coefficient um, is not matched in, in many countries, uh, rich countries around the world. Um, but we, in the report, we, we also dig down into how the income distribution <coughs> differs across countries. Um, so we can look, for example, just at the, the top 10%. Uh, in the UK, 29% of disposable income goes to the, the top 10th. Um, but actually, that's much higher than in most other rich nations. It's really just the UK and the US that stand out. Um, so these are the differences with the UK. Uh, and you see that uh, the big differences are not just with Scandinavian countries, for example, uh, but also uh, uh, Australia, Ireland, um, Israel, uh, Japan, South Korea, really the entire uh, rich world except for um, the US. Uh, the flip side of that is uh, less money goes to everyone else. So if we look at the, the middle fifth, for example, um, again, you see big differences um, with all other uh, rich nations, except the US. Um, so to dig a bit more into uh, the drivers of growth and inequality, um, it's worth looking at what matters for household incomes across the distribution. Uh, to show that it's really just, uh, we can break it down into earnings, uh, that includes the importance of employment, uh, benefits uh, in purple here, uh, taxes and housing costs. Um, so those are five areas I'm going to go through briefly now. Um, a first key lesson is the sort of overwhelming importance of productivity growth, which may be an obvious point, but it's, it's worth stressing. Uh, if we look at what's driven growth in GDP per capita um, uh, over a scale of decades, um, it's really entirely um, growth in productivity per hour. Um, so hours have tended to, to fall over time so that they don't boost incomes. Uh, employment has gone up and down, um, uh, but can't really compete with um, uh, the importance of productivity, although it did play a supporting role in the 2010s. Um, but obviously employment rates and hours matter for uh, inclusion and inequalities. Um, on hours, for example, um, the UK has had a growing share of um, low-paid men doing part-time work, um, which has, has put some upward pressure on inequality. Uh, but there's been good news on employment. Um, sort of from 20, uh, 2007 to 2019, um, employment rates rose altogether uh, and rose quite a lot more for the bottom half of the income distribution than for the top half, so helping to, to narrow some income gaps. Um, so, um, productivity, productivity um, and earnings growth matter enormously for income growth, um, but that's sort of not a sufficient answer for how to boost income uh, in a progressive way. Um, this chart shows what happens if we increase earnings across the distribution, uh, across the uh, earnings distribution by 15% for everyone, uh, and see what that does to household disposable incomes. Um, and we see that uh, it boosts the incomes of richer households on the right um, by more than poorer households on the left. Uh, that's largely a function of uh, the fact that other sources of income, uh, i.e. benefit income, uh, are also important for poorer households. Uh, and that some poorer households face quite high marginal tax rates, so they might lose the majority of earnings growth to taxes and um, uh, universal credit tapering in the future. Um, so you can't just have earnings growth if you want progressive growth. Um, you also need to look at the benefit system um, and the relative value of benefits to earnings. Um, so in the past, for example, uh, we had problems with the state pension declining relative to earnings, uh, which you can see over the decades here, uh, and then deliberately turning it around through links to earnings and then through a triple lock. Uh, in contrast, unemployment support um, has, has continuously declined uh, for decades, really. Um, and this year will be down <coughs> to about half, it, half of what it was about 50 years earlier. Um, 
although there was the, the brief spike um, that you can see when the, the £20 a week was added to unemployment support. Um, and if we don't do that uh, in, in the long term, benefits will continue to decline relative to earnings. Uh, taxes, on the other hand, have, uh, have tended to boost um, uh, incomes over time, sort of uh, despite what you might think with uh, overall taxes rising at the moment relative to GDP. Um, tax rates on low and middle earners um, are fairly low by historic standards. Um, this is just looking at income tax and national insurance, um, although they are set to go up uh, over the next few years. Uh, finally, uh, although the UK also has relative, relatively low tax rates compared to other countries, uh, if we look at rents, uh, rents are higher in the UK uh, compared to most other rich nations. Uh, and here you can see what's happened to, to rents and, and mortgage costs over time relative to people's incomes. Um, so you can see a, a ballooning in the 1980s, for example, of housing costs relative to incomes. Um, uh, in the mid-2000s, uh, a rise in housing costs relative to incomes, um, which, which sort of depressed living standards growth. Um, and a bit of progress since then, actually. Uh, uh, average housing costs relative to incomes have fallen from about 19% to 16%, which, if that happened to, to you as a household, would be worth about uh, the equivalent to like a 4% boost in your household income, so relatively large. Um, that's not been shared equally. Um, it's been especially driven by declining mortgage costs, um, which is obviously only favoured some and uh, certainly won't continue in the future. Um, but there has also been some good news on rents relative to incomes, uh, with some, some signs of that coming back down again. Um, so hopefully we can dig into those in more detail in the chat. Um, but to conclude, uh, we've had twin problems of weak growth and persistently high inequality uh, and those have not left households in a good place uh, going into uh, the COVID-19 crisis and cost of living crisis. Uh, historical and international experience suggests we can do better on both growth and inequality. Uh, I think it's fair to say that progressive growth should be uh, a shared goal to some degree uh, and then in the UK we, uh, sorry, in the report we look at um, how the UK is actually committed in theory to reducing poverty and delivering faster growth for the bottom 40% than for the rest of the population through the Sustainable Development Goals. Um, and our ongoing Economy 2030 inquiry is digging into uh, some of these big pictures as well. Um, and in future, we'll be looking at the policies needed to, to turn some of this around uh, and deliver strong productivity growth, uh, a labour market that uh, delivers for workers um, tax and benefit system that uh, provides more insurance um, when shocks hit and ensures that growth is shared uh, and delivers a, a housing market that um, doesn't just absorb all the income growth that does happen. Great. No pressure there, Adam. Right. Very good. Thank you very much. I, I hope someone upstairs has got those four bullets down and has the answers ready to roll. Right, Polly, we've got high inequality, we've got low growth. It's a turkey. What do you reckon? Turkey. I just I rushed here from writing about this for my column for, for, for tomorrow's Guardian, and I start by warning readers that they will sink their head in their hands uh, and despair when they read this. Don't do that. <laughs> but uh, and indeed, many of them may actually be tempted to pick up their families and go away and emigrate. It's so grim, uh, and I, there's no denying that it's a it's a hard read, but incredibly important. Um, Never mind exactly when we are about to reach a technical recession. What we see here is that most families have been in one for 15 years. Um, and I think we're still capable of being shocked by things like this. It comes at us all the time. That Britain has fallen so far down the ranking in uh, all of the EU that only Greece and Cyprus have lower household income growth is, I think, uh, extraordinary. And I think this, um, this audit grimly lays out the British disease, which is low pay, high inequality and low productivity. Um, only Bulgaria in the EU is more unequal than us, and that takes some thinking about. Um, 
Well, the report doesn't say, but I think it's plain to any reader uh, who looks at it, is that uh, the strikers have got to get their pay. Uh, they're only trying to stop their pay falling behind these, this uh, uh, rapid rise of, um, uh, of inflation. Um, and what this audit, and Adam call its comments on it, make plain, is just how urgent it is to see that pay keeps rising. Certainly that it doesn't fall back some 7 or 8% this year, and that benefits must rise at the same level of, say, the triple lock on the pension. I have various views on the triple lock on the pension, but certainly the rest of benefits absolutely should be up there. Oh, is it? Sorry, is it knocking about? Is that all right? So sorry. All right. Um, economic doom figures are uh, tumbling out day after day. Pick up the FT or indeed the Guardian, and you can see the plight that we're in and that things are about to get worse. And that despite desperate labour shortages, which are often just the wrong people in the wrong place for rottenly paid jobs, Bank of England and OBR say that unemployment is soon going to start rising to 5.5%. And this audit shows the fate that awaits those who do fall out of work. Over a quarter of households don't have savings that would see them through one month. And that takes some thinking about. Uh, unemployment pay is at its lowest on record. Uh, only 13% of average pay, lower than any in the EU. When you think about Sweden, that has 90% of, uh, it gives 90% of, of the pay of somebody who's fallen out of work to support them through looking for their next job. You see a completely different uh, civilised attitude towards what should happen to the unemployed. I think the gathering clouds of recession that are, are rolling in seem likely to hit UK pretty much hardest, and consumer confidence has just fallen to its lowest ever, which is the strongest predictor of gloom, of doom. Um, sterling fell another 10% in the last year after having already fallen after the Brexit vote. Balance of trade gap after Brexit is now uh, an absolutely eye-watering 8.3%. Now, I know how bad that is because the first election, I have to admit, that I covered was 1970 when Harold Wilson was miles ahead, expected to win, and in the last 24 hours, new balance of trade figures came out and they showed a stunning 0.2% rise. And now we're faced with an 8.3% rise, but it lost him the election. Actually, it was to do with two jumbo jets having arrived that hadn't been accounted for. But there it was. He lost the election for something much less than where we are now. And the Resolution Foundation has its own hair-raising figures in other reports about the damage done by Brexit to living standards. And I was really glad, Adam, to see this audit quote, sustainable growth goals that the UK has signed up to, because I have to admit I'd forgotten about them. And I hadn't really thought of them as applying to us. It's kind of global. It's kind of of other countries, other people. So it was great to be reminded that um, we have signed up to something that says by 2030, we will reduce by half the proportion of people living in poverty and that we will raise uh, the growth and in income of the bottom 40% of the population at a rate higher than the national average, which would be transformative if we could do that. Instead, of course, the bank, uh, treasury, busy tightening the screw, raising interest rates into a storm, squeezing out a demand that always isn't there on an inflation that isn't caused here, by uh, inten intentionally raising unemployment. What's to be done? Taxes do need to rise, especially for the rich, till the pips squeak the way Dennis Healy did. Um, closer to, well, at least you could get closer to how those top rates were in his day, our most equal years in history. There are billions, of, uh, billions lost in tax loopholes that need closing, but in the end, as Adam said, we all know it is only productivity that really lifts uh, living standards in the long run. Pay and benefits need to rise, not just for social justice, but to contribute to higher productivity. So uh, where employers value and invest in their workforce and, and equipment. But business investment is on strike. It was already abysmally low for a long time. Preferring dividends and share buy buybacks, business investment has fallen by 9.3% 
below pre-COVID levels. And that is a market failure where only the state can step in with a massive proactive investment boost. Uh, should be jettisoning treasury rules that don't that count human capital, which is often more valuable than bricks and mortar, and allow investment in capital uh, which lasts through educated generations forever. So, but nevertheless, FE funding has fallen, abysmally low, falling numbers of apprenticeships, and this year university places are falling for the hardest hit cohort of 18 year olds. Huge capital. Invest, human capital investment really is needed urgently uh, and we also need to and the only hope is state investment to shoot through a decade of moribund or longer productivity renewable energy insulation house building R&D to match more successful countries with highly trained and educated people uh, beyond fossilized treasury thinking there are lots of other ideas um, Keep across one. Why not use the 70 billion that is uh, in, uh, invested in tax-free ISAs every year and say that tax relief should only apply when that's invested in productivity boosting government green bonds, securely backed, paying a decent revenue. Why do we, why do we let that happen when we could be using that money much more productively? As usual, to end on a positive note, so I'd better try, uh, <laughs> with nerve and daring and imagination and above all political will, of course we can end this downward spiral of low living standards, low productivity. I mean, New Zealand under Jacinta Hearn, uh, Hearn does look very tempting, but I don't think we need to emigrate quite yet. Thank you very much, Polly. I think there needs to be no emigrating people. <laughs> No one's getting out. We're all in this together. You're going to pull your fingers out and sort it out rather than getting on a plane. Right, David, how are we going to sort it out? Well, um, uh, thanks very much for inviting me along. And Adam, congratulations on an excellent analysis, which is so relevant to the themes that Polly was just touching on and which we focus on in our economic inquiry. Because I think the first point is that, of course, in the long run, it's GDP per head and productivity that determine living standards. But what Adam shows in his paper is that even once you accept that as the backdrop, there are still specific decisions that can be taken that affect exactly how well different groups do. So as well as the big picture, he gets us to focus on the specifics. And then even more interesting, and I think significant for the UK, um, we're actually a country where labor, sh unlike the US, labor share of income has held up quite well. And we're also quite a high employment country, okay, doing better on t employment um, than on hours worked, as Adam shows. So to be doing reasonably well on labour share and reasonably well on employment, but still have some of these really stark figures is a kind of challenge for better policy. And Adam ruthlessly eliminates some of the options with which we are familiar. Uh, he first of all, pretty much eliminates the hope that even more work can be done by the minimum wage, national living wage. Um, and there is an interesting bit of role reversal here. I remember uh, when Labour were originally proposing the, the minimum wage, I was one of the sceptics. And one reason why I was a sceptic was I said it'll, increase, it'll cause massive unemployment. It's and that argument has, been proved, for David. That argument has <laughs> been proved wrong. Those fears were misplaced. It's massive sicko. But the other argument that we used was that people were exaggerating their hopes of what it could do for poverty as a whole. And the interesting feature, and, and I thought it was the time it was oversold, because there were people, there were people on low incomes who weren't active in the labour market, and there were also some people um, on low wages who were in quite high income households. And the interesting feature is in this respect, the debate has gone 180 degrees. And now the Treasury and Tory ministers are claiming more for the minimum wage than it can really do and say, don't worry, we'll do more on the national living wage. That's how we'll tackle it. So it is worth, this is a salutary reminder that it's a useful part of the armory, but it's probably bearing as much weight as it possibly can. Um, and then the other option that Adam brilliantly uh, demolishes is the tax cut option, showing that actually the average direct tax rate 
of people on low incomes in this country is already quite low, partly because, of course, our income tax allowance is high. Actually, I think that was a mistaken policy. It's an incredibly expensive one and not particularly well targeted. But anyway, we have, a, we have a lot of people on low incomes who aren't in income tax and after the Chancellor's latest measures may not even be in national insurance. So you don't, so you, so direct tax cuts as a way out of the problem are also eliminated. So Adam forces us to consider the benefit system and how that can be designed. And the one area where he pulls his punch is that although he refers to it, it is striking that for any given level of benefit spending and the figures that um, we recently calculated here is that for, for uh, family, since, since 2010 policy changes, have lowered the income of families by £375 compared with inflation, and whereas for pensioners, they've actually gone up. So we have been deliberately using the benefit system to favour pensioners over families. Um, and one obvious point to start is a rebalancing so that there's a fairer distribution of the benefit bill, tackling, of course, the widespread misconception that unemployment benefit is so expensive. It's interesting, that misconception is one of the reasons why there's a market for endless cuts in unemployment benefit, when the total unemployment benefit bill now is about five billion pounds and the pension bill is over 100 billion pounds. Now finally, what, so how could we set about doing it and what's politically possible? The housing costs point is very vivid and the difference, the, the difference between incomes before and after housing costs and the very high cost of housing and Britain's unusually high levels of rent which in turn lower living standards of people having to pay those rents. I think that's a place to, to focus on, rebalancing away from pensioners. Um, children of course, but also single unemployed people get an incredibly raw deal. Now what's politically possible and what, what the kind of arguments that I find work with my colleagues, as I do still take the Tory whip in the House of Lords. I think, first of all, the argument which appeared in one of the slides, Adam's excellent slides, that people in the middle are also suffering. And now what I'm about to say may sound cynical, and I apologise in advance, but if, if part of the Tory coalition has been successfully to get people in the middle thinking their incomes are like and interests are the same as the people at the top. You put together a coalition of property owners and earners and people who think we share the same interests. The more that people in the middle look like people at the bottom of the heap, and it more looks as if their interests and the narrative of their lives is like the narrative of people at the bottom of the heap, then the Conservative Party has a problem. And I would argue that that was a strategic problem. And I would secondly, remind people that the purpose of the welfare state, going back to the great advocates from Beveridge to Bismarck, was an insurance function. Not simply a redistribution of function, an insurance function. And the insurance function of the state is a legitimate one that Tories can well understand. And we have seen in the last few years two vivid examples if the state is not properly discharging its insurance function, namely incredibly expensive ad hoc measures put together at short notice, first because of COVID and then because of energy costs, because the remaining infrastructure of the benefit system wasn't able to bear a burden that you might have expected it at least to do something to contribute to. So you end up with expensive ad hocery rather than a well-designed system. And I hope that those type of arguments, alongside the powerful points that Polly makes, would actually move politics into a better place. Great. Thank you very much, David. The um, Tories for boosting the middle is going to be like a new campaign mm -hmm. slogan. The, uh, right. OK. The, um, uh, I, I thought we've got half an hour. So I thought what we should do is do a bit about what's going on. Right. We're going to find the answer in about 10 minutes. And then we'll do what on earth should we do about it, running through the kind of areas we've touched on. When we come to the areas where we're going to do about it, I'm going to force us to be like one thing that's gone, in each of them we need to be one thing that's gone well and we should keep doing, and then we'll do one thing that we should probably stop uh, messing up. But first of all now, remember, to ask questions, go on to Slido, it's hashtag living standards. We're going to start with a poll on Slido, which you three can have a vote on as well. I know how David, I don't, I can guess how Paul is going to vote, but I don't know. Here we go, right. What are you actually most worried about? Okay, you're not allowed to have all of them, obviously. Right, so what are you most worried about? High inequality, low growth. The paper basically 
published today basically says it's the combination of the two that's the defining problem of Britain in the 2020s. But which one are you most worried about? Come on, David. Which one are you most worried about? I have to say low growth. And look, I, I want to see, and after all, this is the core purpose of the, of the Resolution Foundation, I want to see the incomes of the less affluent half the British population rising. Um, and, in a, uh, and it seems to me that that is the priority they're securing their income rises. And although, of course, in the 1980s, we did have what, looking back, was a very stark increase in inequality, it was also in an environment where wages and incomes, for most people, not for everyone, but for mo including for most workers, were rising quite a lot. So, yeah, we need to raise the growth rate, and we, that needs to be used to boost living standards of the less affluent half. Adam, in, so in the 1980s, so inequality is going up a lot, the bottom's incomes grew more in the 1980s than the last 15 years? Even worse, I think. They were worse then, yeah, as in zero. It depends how in by the yeah. bottom. All right, go on then. Well, Adam is the guru on the figure. How far, you, how far up look do we have to go to get to the 80s? It depends if you're measuring benefit income and obviously what happened to pensions, or whether you're looking at workforce income, including so the wages pay. are definitely growing faster in the 80s. So the slide I showed uh, showed that the, the bottom 40% or so um, of non-pensioners uh, had very poor growth at times in the, the 1980s. Um, and I think... That's partly because of changes in employment as well. Yeah. So even if earnings were going up for, for many people. All the ones that dropped out of work. Yeah. Okay. The, Adam, what's your answer? I'm tempted to say the same, uh, that you, you can't boost living standards sustainably without growth. Some growth going on. But I, I think some of the international comparisons suggest that for, for many households, just like copying the income distribution of another country would boost their incomes by like a lot. Like you'd need a lot. That's, of, very, that's very technical. <laughs> yes, my technical answer. Uh, you'd need a, uh, yeah a lot of uh, of general growth to deliver the same as, as just okay. matching the inequality of another country. Right, that's a cop out. So which one are you going for? I go for uh, high inequality. No, I think you case. came down in the end. Right, Polly. Which one do you want? You're the deciding. I think I'd vote. go for low growth because uh, I don't no. think you can possibly do it with high inequality. I, mean, I suppose you could cut off a few of the tall poppies, but. Um, Basically, you are not going to get good, strong, permanent growth in a very unequal society. But that's what we failed to persuade people about. People think inequality doesn't matter. Mm. So you two are both going for low growth. Okay, here's my then question, which is, we'll come back to a punter's answers in a second. As I say, Slido, it's hashtag living standards. So given that you're voting for that, so probably let's do this unfairly for you. So good old fashioned Tories always wanted growth. Chunks of the left think growth doesn't matter because it doesn't feed through into ordinary living standards. You get these like hashtag not my GDP thing, which is quite popular. Um, uh, this report is basically saying, what on earth are you talking about? The poor in the middle are getting hammered by the lack of growth. So why, why, don't, why don't lefties just get really pro-growth in brackets sustainably and all the rest? Well, there is an anti-growth which is about sustainability. Yeah, so let's park that. Let's we can't go on. If, you know, the, the, the if everybody on the planet yeah. grows as we grew in the past, well, we'd we be that. dead quicker. Um, so I think there is a, an argument about that, about what kind of growth. Is it the right kind of growth? But um, it's very hard to see how a long... If you, just, if you had very low growth and you just went for inequality... Um, it's very hard to see how the redistribution would really deliver enough in the long term to help the poorest people enough. OK, very good. Right, let's bring up the results of the poll and see what you all thought. The panel is two to one on low growth. Oh, Adam, look, it's fine. You've won anyway. It's fine. You don't need, you don't need, you don't need these people. <laughs> affirmation from the people. That's how all good demagogues start. Right, OK. The, um, uh, so that's on the like big picture of these two different things going on at the same time. That is worth saying. The, is the, it is the interaction of the two yeah. that gets you these very... Like, the truth is, both really matter, obviously, yeah. and it's the interaction of the two that is toxic for low and middle income yeah. households collectively, the opposite of the coalition of not the middle and the top, but the middle and the bottom. It is the high inequality and the low growth that matters. Um, the top, obviously, does well enough from the high inequality that the low growth is less of a, um, less of a problem. Right, then I want to touch on the current crisis, which you all touched on a bit, but how this context hits that. OK, so I think we should do that in the past and we should do it in terms of the future. OK, so on the past, the, um, we basically got 
what happens when a country that has had 15 years of slow growth and 40 years of high inequality hits a cost of living crisis? And Adam's stat on that respect is quite sobering in terms of the percentage of the population that can't survive without their income disappearing for just a month. They have so little savings. The, um, so the, the flip side of that is the future, where we didn't show this chart in the report, I don't think, but, um, but the, reco the recovery from this crisis because of the slow growth underpinning it is, or well, the Bank of England's forecast, for example, is showing that we don't get back to the income levels we had in the pandemic by the middle of this decade, right? So that like being in lockdown was as good as it got in terms of living standards. And that, so that's not very encouraging for the future and the past has made... So given all that, don't we think it's a bit weird? We've kind of almost got used to this. I do worry slightly in Britain, we're like Stockholm syndrome to our like cost of living <laughs> crisis, basically. We're all like, I mean, it's catastrophic, but it's been going on so long now, we kind of think, oh, it's quite bad for everybody. We don't really get, it's getting, like, it's much worse here than in other countries. What do you reckon, David? Are, are we Stockholm syndrome? Um, well, we, it is, uh, it, it is, people think a part of the narrative for any party in government is whenever you've got a problem, you immediately call it the global problem. The first of all, you frame it as always. We just as an example of a wider phenomenon. It's the global and post office crisis. So it crisis. becomes the global <laughs> problem. Is. And so the the and while there is of course a global element, this is not there is a wider problem. But nevertheless, it is certainly particularly acute in Britain. We can see that. Um, and I think it. Well, it, what does it mean? Well, um, we saw only in the in March a vivid example. Of what it means? The uh, no but April. The Chancellor tried to hold the line, but you end up. However much you're trying to hold the line, you end up spending 15 billion pounds. You end up with a massive package. So the political, the politics is that eventually you end up having to spend a lot of money on it. And you also have a more unpleasant politics because it's basically a zero sum game. You're talking about a zero sum game society. And of course, in a zero sum game, I understand why Adam and a large number of the participants thought, well, we've got to do something about inequality. But you end up taking from one group to give to another. If only <coughs> you could drive higher growth, that would be far better. But if we do not, I think, and where my party is in a state of denial, you end up getting redistributive taxation. And you end up with higher levels of taxation of the well-off and, uh, in, and panic increases in benefits because of the political pressures. That's the scenario which we have to escape from. Does the Conservative Party want growth? Well... There is, it was interesting going back to your challenge to Polly, because it applies the other way around to Conservatives, which the answer is that cabinet ministers want growth, senior Tories want growth, people can see that growth is one of our most acute failures. On the other hand, when you look at the Tory grassroots and Tory constituencies, and the fact that, as we've shown at Resolution, and I've been arguing, a very high proportion of the Tory vote now is amongst older people, you try to get planning permission for building a factory or building a warehouse or building a housing estate almost anywhere in Tory voting southeast. When you look at it close up, actual real economic change is not necessarily the, what a large number of Tory voters want. So you have this tension between what I think the people at the, in the government want and what actually Tory voters want vote for. They, by and large, would rather not have housing estate, new housing estates, and not have new roads, and not have warehouses and factories. Um, and that is a pressure internally within the Tory party. Polly, same question to you. Does the Labour Party want, actually want any growth? They keep saying the word a lot. It's like growth bingo at the moment. Peer yes. speeches are like, I'm going to get me some growth all the time. But does anyone, do they actually want growth? I think so. I think Labour will only succeed in power if it shows that it has produced a higher growth rate. Otherwise, it's done for. I think it's, um, its recipe has to be this kind of investment. I mean, you've got Rachel Reed <clears throat> said she's going to invest 28 billion a year in uh, green investment, which is terrific. And that's a lot of money. Um, and there will be other things too. And that is because that has to be, has to be an engine for growth. I mean, I think on the left, there is this always this optimism. We thought it would be the bankers crash. And then we thought maybe COVID. And now we think maybe this is the time that consciousness changes. Maybe this is the time that people really get it about what's happening, about how grotesquely dysfunctional the shape of the economy is. Uh, and I think it really might be. I think the fact that the unions have been asleep all this time is extraordinary. And people go on these militant unions. Where have the militant unions been for these 15 years? It's been, they've been 
astoundingly acquiescent. And maybe their rising up uh, does stimulate an awful lot of people to demand more. And um, that could be a good thing. What percentage of the lowest earners in the private sector are members of trade unions? Oh, they're not. And Anyone? the trade unions have never really represented them either. Never really, okay. even when they were strong. Okay. But they do pull everything up with them because, uh, you know, if they're mostly public sector or previous public sector workers in unions now, the private sector will be obliged to match them if they want to hold on to their workforce. The answer is 10%. 10% of the brain unions, which is a plug for a paper on Thursday on worker power. You should come along to mm. the next event, the Residue Foundation. Obviously, we're a marketing machine here. We're not going to miss a chance <laughs> to plug uh, that. Right, let's let's take two of the questions. So the first one is going directly to the one that Polly's raising, which is the, the, and the second we're going to come on to this long term, what are the answers. But on the, on the tight labour market right now, so here's the question, if we can bring it up. The, um, here you go. Right, so the, um, we've got a tight labour market. Everyone got told a tight labour market would be like boom time for the workers, uh, but their incomes are going down, so the plan does not appear to have worked out. What is going on? Do we put too much weight on full employment? There, Polly? Uh, yeah, I mean, what's going on is that they are rubbish jobs, and a lot of them couldn't necessarily pay all that much more if it's sort of marginal bar work. And a lot of, you know, if it's been today, huge numbers of pubs closing down. Wrong people, wrong place, wrong fit. It isn't, nor, nor is our employment. There is still quite a high lot of uh, hidden unemployment and hidden underemployment going on as well. Of people who want more hours, we have a very perverse universal credit system. Mm -hmm. Makes it almost impossible to earn more than, yeah. to work more than 16 hours if you're very low paid, which is insane. Um, so that the labour market isn't quite as neat fitting as it looks. You know, why aren't all these round pegs in round holes? Okay. Yeah, I mean, we are basically on about 75% as an employment rate, and I think it would be make a lot of sense to have a target of 80% employment and look at the groups, some of them the over 50s, which again, RF has analysed as being out of the labour market. But there's a second point, which I very much agree with the point that Polly just made, and I think is underemphasized. And I remember having the argument with successive work and pension secretaries, because the, the Ian Duncan Smith universal credit model, is a, he loved, it's a straight line model. And um, the old, the prior system did have quite strong kinks, in particular trying to get people above 16 hours and above 30 hours. And I can remember By trying, kinks, you mean sorry, financial yeah, I mean, incentives? In other words, yes, nation. financial incentives. It was not just a straight line. And these straight line models with no clear step changes, it's worth your while to get above 16, it's worth your while to get above 30, do not have the same incentives to increase your hours above key points that the oldest so you're a bit Gordon and Brown. I can remember the discussions I can remember the discussions saying hang on but this, the assumption is always that these straight lines will move people up they may also move some people down so this is I think quite a significant but the by the end the straight liners thought that the idea you had any sort of kinks in the system was an absurdity and they used to be very proud this was one of the great things that reformers had got rid of I think we're now living with the long term consequences oh, good. The, um, so Adam what do you think so we've got it is true. I mean, it is true, particularly if you're in the US, like Democratic policymakers have spent like 20 years saying if only we got to full employment, it would all be OK. What's going wrong? So I think if we look within the sort of 15 year periods, like uh, there has been some some periods where earnings have been doing fairly well. You can give, us, you can give us some good news. So like before the financial crisis, earnings were growing OK, but it was housing costs especially. That, that weighed on uh, disposable income growth. So that's one example. But then thinking back to sort of 2019, like wage growth was also performing fairly well and we were starting to think that the yeah, tight labour market was maybe beginning to, uh, to have positive impacts there. Uh, and then it was sort of a, um, a terrible shock, obviously, that COVID-19 hit and brought that to a, a rapid end. Um, but yeah, if you're being optimistic, you might say that we're sort of getting back to a tight labour market now. Uh, and if we get through the period of, uh, or, if or, or when we get through the period of 11% inflation, uh, we might see the same happen again. Yeah, I think we should be a bit careful about, like, too much weight is put on full employment to solve all our problems, definitely. But we shouldn't put, the current situation is not the same as normal full employment times. Like, it's not surprising we're getting industrial action. We've got really high inflation. It's making the whole country poorer. And then we're going to have a 
we're going to have a dispute about who gets made poorer. Yeah. Basically, that's the exam question. Yeah. And we're going to, some of that's going to play out in the tax and benefit system. And some of that's going to play out in industrial um, disputes. And, and in the end, it will come out in the wash and we'll have made our mind up about who paid the price and who didn't. And the, um, obviously, we have views on who that should be in terms of making sure that it's not lowest income households or lowest earners that are the ones that lose out. But in the end, this is one big discussion of who gets yeah. made poorer. You're absolutely right. And, that's, and the old critiques, you're, we're dusting down the old critiques of high inflation in the 70s and 80s. And one of the argument was this was a society that had not got a shared sense of who and uh, what. Inflation is how you reconcile ex post irreconcilable, conflicting and excessive demands for resources ex ante. If you've got large numbers of people who are expecting to have higher living standards and your economy is delivering, you use inflation in order to balance this out. And we always saw that as an evidence of a failing political system and a failing political economy. And I'm afraid that's the territory we're now back into. All right. Well, thanks for perking us up even further. Right. OK. And I want to focus on what we're actually going to do. OK, so like we've covered the drivers of income growth here. Adam took us through those. So let's go through each of those in turn, have a ponder about what our answer is. So on, let's do productivity um, first, because that's the one that Adam told us is basically doing 100% of the action in the long run. The, um, which, again, I don't think is what everybody basically broadly thinks. Now, the question that someone's raised here, here we go, Jim's question, is, um, OK, look, that happens overall. <laughs> Um, but what happened? But does everybody benefit from that productivity, or is it just some people broadly? Okay. The, um, so Adam, just take us through a bit through the, the like the history of who's got what productivity over time. Gosh, I'm um, having that first chart. But uh, well, I guess it's, it's worth stressing that like even if productivity raises in increases in some sectors, that should spill over into others in terms of pay. Um, you know, you still need to. Uh, uh, people still need to buy haircuts, so the wages of hairdressers should, should also go up. Uh, and then there are some sectors where the level of pay is just a policy choice, so the care sector especially, uh, if we have low pay in those sectors, that's because we've, we've chosen to do so, um, even if productivity does not change dramatically over time. Yeah. Liz, should we make that concrete for people? So, so imagine there's just two sectors of the economy, right? There's the haircutters, and then there's the car makers and floggers, all right? Okay, and the economy gets more productive maybe because we can sell more cars aboard or whatever, and we move a worker from the hair cutters into the car floggers, right? Okay, probably shouldn't say floggers, it sounds a bit violent, but the car makers, all right? They, um, their, their earnings on average are higher, right? So the economy's got richer, but there's one fewer hairdressers, okay? So everyone's a bit richer, they buy more haircuts because in the end, we're not all totally insensitive to what we look like. Okay, so we're a bit richer, so we buy a few more haircuts. Sorry, David. This is the bow mark. This, this is, is the little bow mark. Uh, but the point is, it puts up demand for hairdressers. Yeah, yeah. Either the hairdressers become more productive, unlikely. Mm -hmm. Productivity just means worse haircuts in hairdressing. They are, or wages rise in hairdressing to drag some more workers into yes. hairdressing, right? So it's not, I think this is a danger. Yeah. I often hear people say versions yeah. of this, which is basically, there's no point getting better at these advanced things because it won't help with the wages of poor households. That is not how Indeed. a labor market actually um, actually works. So so don't get too pessimistic. The de it's definitely true that lower income households, lower earning households, sorry, lower earners, sorry, didn't benefit as much from productivity growth in some phases over the last 30 years, but that's not true in the last 10 years. In the last 10 years, it's all about no one getting any productivity growth. And can I very briefly be a tiny bit of a technophile and say this assumption that there are sectors where you can't get productivity improvements you get may you be get too pessimistic. You may find there are ways, something which we can't entirely plan and expect, where some of these sectors, which we've written off as low productivity sectors, have rapid technological change or innovation and end up proving that they can do more. David once made me have to meet a robot seal that in Japan <laughs> oh, yeah, is being used right. to provide <laughs> care uh, and told me that yeah. this was a sign of great yeah. productivity. There's many yeah. things we agree about, David. Yeah. That was not one. <laughs> right. Okay. So productivity. So let's go through. So having some, so the good news is having, on each of these, I want to do some good news and some bad news. So the good news is having some productivity in general does look like it feeds through yes. to wages. It doesn't feed through to benefit system automatically. It doesn't raise the bottom as much as the middle of the top income-wise. But in terms of earnings, it can raise, and it is our big problem uh, right now. So that's a bit of perkiness to get us through. Right, employment. So Adam, give us some good news about what has worked on employment in the past. 
whose incomes that has raised or pushed in inequality down, and then we'll move to some depressing news on employment. I won't go into like what policies have, have, <laughs> have influenced those or, or haven't, but um, certainly employment rates um, have increased since the, the 1990s, and part of that's for, for women especially, so single parents are much more likely to be in work now uh, it's all women, than in the it? past, and there are more second earners as well. Yep. Um, uh, so that, that's been a big change in, in uh, how incomes distributed um, between and within households. Um, uh, obviously, the, the recession uh, increased unemployment, but um, yeah, the country sort of bounced back from that uh, and then some. Although a part of it is uh, the state pension age going up for for women, uh, increasing the number of, of older women in the workforce. So should we should we think about higher employment as the route to higher incomes, or should we think about it as the route to a more inclusive society, a better country for other reasons? Uh, I think it's, well, it obviously does both, but which, how do you want us to think about it? Yeah, I think that the decomposition we showed uh, shows that in terms of overall incomes, uh, employment is, is much less important uh, than productivity growth. Yep. Um, sort of even in, in the 2010s, so I think in future, um, if there was low-hanging fruits, we've already picked it, and it should, it should get even harder to, to drive strong growth from employment changes. Um, but yeah, definitely in terms of some groups, you can definitely increase their incomes, uh, and employment growth has tended to uh, uh, sort of be a bit of a, a boost towards low-income households. Yeah, I think he's working. What is your number in the report? We've got two thirds of the employment gains in the last decade went to the bottom half of the distribution, or even more than that. It's very bottom-heavy the jobs growth. Yeah, I think its employment rate went up by about six points in the bottom half. And that was mostly women. Half. Yeah. Women, with women for the first time yeah. going into the labour market. Yeah. Maybe for the first time, but you see lots of older second earners went back in again. They, um, but it, women of all ages went back and, in. Even and staying it, longer in there. And interestingly, the, the, the working from home, you know, the COVID, again, another piece of work we did yeah. showed that one, some groups like the over 50s had sadly disengaged. It looks like mothers with young children, for them, the working from home model had increased their labour force participation even during... Yep. The That's because their 50 year old mums were staying home. <laughs> oh, they Don't take it personally. <laughs> the grandparents. The grandparents are, are the doing the work. We must Keep it up, right. grandparents. The country yes. needs yes. some workers. Yes. We need to get a looking after the grandkids. Yep. Right, Polly, on, the, on employment, on the downside, someone has raised the question here, which is basically okay, we talk about unemployment. Inactivity is the thing that's gone up. David's just talked about the short term issue in terms of a cohort of 55 pluses who mm. are not in the labour market now, yeah. probably aren't coming back. We've got no way of contacting them even if we wanted to. The, um, but on the longer term trend, yeah. um, we've obviously had inactivity after the 80s driven by men, and particularly with physical disabilities. And more recently, we've got a rise in mental ill health driving inactivity in the labour market. So, how much should we focus on that in the next phase? Well, our sickness and disability benefits are pathetic. Uh, and they certainly should be much higher. We have, you know, th these terrifying numbers of long COVID. Nobody knows how long that lasts, and a lot of them are very sick. A lot of them aren't necessarily registered as sick and may just yep. have drifted away from the yep. labour market. We don't know enough about the people who aren't working. But, um, you know, I, I don't see that going away in a hurry, and I think the mental health question too is huge. It definitely yeah. And, and this, this, this group that is so hard to help, which is the single young men, and again, recent RF work, the, the women of, by and large, have been increasingly participating in the workforce, which has reduced the number of young NEETs. But the male NEET rate has barely changed, but an increasing numbers reporting issues like mental health problems. So that's a clear group to target. Okay, right. Let's go to tax. So let's do some good news first of all, David. So I thought the good news for Adam's report is that, so we've got all these conservatives saying, I want a bigger army, but I want lower taxes, okay? And at one level we giggle and say like, that's not how it works, mate, okay? But at another level, more constructively, what Adam's chart is, shows you is that in terms of the actual effective tax rates paid by most people over 40 years, those have actually been coming down. So maybe kind of low tax conservatives should chill out. The overall tax burden is high, but you know, that's because we've got really high inequality and so rich people are paying more tax because they've got more income, right? But not because the effective tax rate. And if, if, it's the, if it's the marginal tax rate we care about, 
maybe we can just all relax. So can Rishi chill out about everyone shouting at him for being a tax riser? Well, I think Adam's powerful figures were for the average tax rates yeah, and showed the average tax rates being quite low and actually barely moving in the kind of 17% range for the, for the less affluent. And that was a very interesting finding. I mean, marginal rates do matter. And I think both some of the universal credit withdrawal rates, though, again, the chance is trying to yep. help on that. Um, and again, one of the perverse effects of, I think, increasing the tax, the tax allowance so high, given that that does help people at the top as well, you then try to re recover the money off them by lots of peculiar features and slots where there's a very high marginal rate to try to regain it off them, which is a, it's a much less well-designed system. Um, I think for if you ask me to look at it from the kind of conservative perspective, I think there is an argument that, can, that having a lot of people somehow participating in direct tax through income tax and national insurance, so they feel that they're directly contributing to the state, is a good thing, and you then want to lower the rates they pay. I think the allowance versus rates debate is an interesting one within both parties. And, um, this is your stakeholder capitalism side of your case. Yes, kind of. Um, I think there is an argument that when you... Um, yeah, I think there is an argument that having a significant number of people who aren't in income tax at all, if you're looking from a Tory perspective, you might say, hang on, they should be in income tax and have an interest in a lower rate. And now, Polly, um, benefits. OK, so here's a pop version of history, OK, which is we've all decided the benefits in general are only going to go up in line with prices, right? Uh, earnings, except for right now, generally go up faster than prices. The, um, that's like what we're all aiming for. The result of that is if we just stick with our system, we end up with the poor getting relatively poor over time. That's the world that both parties are basically signed up to. It has been uh, for a very long time. Because in the end, that's obviously not totally unsustainable. That's, that's not sustainable. What happens is that governments, particularly governments that want to spend a bit more money on poorer households, give extra money, particularly to uh, families with kids, um, a bit of dealing with housing costs because it becomes unavoidable, basically, and sometimes a bit for those with disabilities, or as David said, pensioners, right? But we end up basically giving some groups extra money because we're but overall having a very mean baseline system. That's our like approach to welfare. The, um, that includes, under the last Labour government, that increased welfare spending quite significantly. The, um, why nobody ever even suggests that you might want to just have a benefit system that does vaguely keep track with earnings because that's how you keep everybody together. It's never even been suggested. I don't think it was even, even in like the leftiest moments of like New Labour, did anyone ever suggest it? Was it even discussed? Did the no, Guardian call for it, Polly? Labour was quite clever at finding ways to talk about benefits that made them acceptable. Yeah. That the word tax credit was clever. You know, benefits, welfare, those are negatives. Tax credits sounded good. It sounded as if you earned them. It sounded as if... I mean, the trouble was, of course, that the people who received them thought they fell out of the sky. They didn't quite understand what they were or how they worked. But, uh, no, of course benefits should keep pace with uh, wages. Of course they should. Um, otherwise, the poor just get poorer and poorer, as we've seen, and it's disgraceful. I mean, there are all sorts of anomalies in the benefit system. I mean, the triple lock, you know, it's ridiculous to give uh, one-off pensioners uh, a, a triple lock. Of course you should hugely load it into pension credit and there is no good reason why every single pensioner shouldn't have somebody knocking on their door to make sure that they're getting their pension credit. I mean that's a, it seems to me a deliberate laxness that something like a third of entitled people entitled don't get it. It should be targeted. We know that pensioners are a group are slightly less likely to be poor than any other group so it's, um, it's, it's a big waste of money that you could shift to other things. Yep. Uh, cuts to children have been utterly shocking. Uh, I mean, the two-child limit, mm. the pension cap. Yeah. And, of course, the other great distortion is housing benefit. There's more and more and more money that should have gone into building social housing has gone into paying uh, private landlords enormous sums of money for pretty squalid housing uh, for no benefit for anybody in the future or ever. That money just has to be pulled back into building social housing that lasts right. and not selling it off. I'm going to bring us up a poll before to start wrapping us up. I'm going to get the last two questions. So, the um, right, what's actually going to happen, people? So, <laughs> are we going to, over the next decade, so 2030 on the dot. So, what's it, what, is, what is the date? 
It's the 4th of July. Okay, so when we're celebrating US celebration days in 2030, will Britain be still having low growth and high inequality, the status quo? Will we have got high growth but kept the high inequality? That's like the US. They have, that hasn't gone very well for them in the last few years, you might have noticed. Uh, are we going to get high growth and low inequality? Norway, here we come, but without the weather. Or are we going to get low growth and low inequality? Which apparently is what Greece has been doing. Come on, David, what's going to happen? Well, obviously, the danger is unless, they, unless our economic inquiry comes up with the absolute right answer, will be well, Adam, low said growth, Adam said you were doing low that. growth and high inequality. I think that the the political backdrop. Let's just um, if there's a moment to unpack inequality. Okay. The, the it's the rise in the value of assets relative to income which has meant that unequally distributed wealth has matters more. So I think there will come a point when some increases in tax on capital in order to fund public services like the NHS becomes yeah. acceptable. So I still think we can aim for a high growth and lower inequality world, and it will involve some tax increases on those who are wealthy, probably more than high earners. Okay, so you're 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 like taking Norway and saying I want high growth and low wealth. Yes, I don't wealth want inequality. It. Yes. Okay, that's very good. Just so we know the Scandinavians have got higher wealth inequality than us, so we're going to need a new country. Oh, really? But the um, well, Sweden. I, thought, I, 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 I haven't looked in Norway. I Sweden. thought our income. Well, our wealth inequality is much higher than our income. Sweet, it is. But Even Sweden now. has higher wealth inequality than us, despite having lower. Basically, the deal was. The Swedish nobility were allowed to keep the wealth, right. so long as they didn't get the income. And, and what up. is it relative to GDP? Is that? Mm, I can't remember. I'll high. find out. Right, Holly. Oh, uh, definitely. We're we going for Norway. You're going to go for Norway. Absolutely. There's no question about it. You have to be optimistic because if you don't yeah. aim for it and believe in it and think it can happen, none of it will happen. I mean, you really have to set your. If you know, if we're going to have a Labour government, they need to set their. Uh, standards very high. There was Tony Blair saying we are going to abolish child poverty by 2020. How did that go? Well, <laughs> instead of getting halfway by 2010, they got a third of the way. Yep. They probably wouldn't have got a third yep. away if they hadn't stuck themselves to that. Okay, Adam. I wrote a Tory oh. manifesto in 1997 that said we will double living standards by in the next 20 years. One of the good but we didn't win the election. You were literally 100% <laughs> like, there's like no chance of winning the election. So you could put whatever you want in there. Free chickens for all. Right, the, uh, Adam. I think as an economist, I'm just going to... This is, a, are we going to have... I know, I know. I'm going to draw a straight line from the, the long-term past and say that growth is going to go up. Uh, mm. Incomes are going to rise like they have over the past 200 years. Uh, but that inequality is also going to go up, as it has tended to, because we've not done a, a great job of finding ways of, of suppressing it. America. So high growth and high inequality. Yeah. And I think so on top of the income inequality, we've got like lots of inheritances. Yeah. Uh, uh, that's in tracks, tracks, which will sort of so you're perky, ensure that people... So you're perky on growth and you think we are stuffed when it comes to divisions. Between. Yeah. What it's, can we do to persuade people not to be America? I mean, we can't get the rich bit of America at the moment, let alone the... the right, let's get the vote because I'm running over because I haven't kept you under okay. remote control at all today. So what will the punters at home think? Mm. Yeah, see, I, mean, I think uh, that is probably, you know, but yours is like, is yours better or worse than that? Better. Better. Yeah, yeah it's okay, all better. Better. Basically, better all of you three were more perfect than, than the public. Okay, yeah. very good. Well, that's all a bit, um, that's a bit depressing. Now, I just want to quickly, there's two questions I want to take where people have uh, the popular questions on Slido. So this one's first of all, Adam, for you, which is, we focused very much here on sources of income growth, but we didn't focus on the cost side of the ledger much. Okay, so childcare, Housing is the only specific cost we touched on. So, what do you reckon? Yeah, childcare is definitely uh, a big one that isn't included in our figures, but it's a, a huge problem for, for lots of people. Uh, obviously, we, we should hope that um, uh, gas prices will will fall back in future. Yep. Uh, it's not a given that they will remain high forever. Um, uh, rent caps. I won't go into rent caps. Um, That's very brave of you. <laughs> but uh, it's certainly possible that, that uh, housing costs might fall relative to income. Yeah, you were quite perky on housing costs. Right, OK. And then last question for you, David. This is a whole one, which is, so we've discussed lots of this about how do you make Britain's market economy work better? Where could income growth come from? Peter Ellis wants to know why don't we, why, why basically we need to get rid of this. We need to systemically reform the market economy. We're too much, this is all too much within the system. Uh, smash the system he doesn't quite say that well actually because i think adam's work shows that things have we have done things have gone wrong particularly in the last 15 years and let's face it that's under five different 
prime ministers. Um, but before that, it is not the case that post-war Britain was a disaster area. We have been able to operate a mixed economy successfully, including times with high living standards and with a functioning welfare state. So we shouldn't use this to give up on the market economy, but it clearly does need reform. Very good. And last word to you, Polly. Yep, it's definitely need debate on systemic reform. Look, look, you know, look at the disasters we've had recently and how it's turned everything upside down. I think people are questioning more. I think their attitudes are more flexible than they've been before. And it is a time to question some absolute fundamentals. But for the time being, let's just stop the Bank of England putting up interest rates. Oh, well, that's controversial. We'll do that on a macro bait. I'm not sure we'll agree on that one. Right, OK, on that, on that interest rate bombshell. Look, can everyone <laughs> thank their panel today? And although like, what, at one level, you know, Adam's got some depressing charts, that's a bit depressing. The most important thing in making progress in life is knowing what you're trying to do. And if you take one thing away from this paper, it's that the problem is the combination of low growth and high inequality. And that tells you what the to-do list is, people. Off you go and do it. Have a good day, everyone. <laughs> Thank you, Justin.